Welcome to the TSI's open course on conservation genomics for threatened species management. My name is Lauren White. I'm a molecular ecologist at the Arthur Ryler Institute for Environmental Research, and I'll be taking you through module 5.2, Steps to Creating Genomic Data. This module aims to give you an overview of a typical conservation genomics project and walk you through the steps that researchers typically take in creating genomic data. On the screen right now are the steps that I'll be covering. I won't be going into too much detail on any one of these. Rather, my aim is to give you a broad idea of what's involved and the main decisions that need to be made at each step. For those interested in more detail, there are other modules in the open course that go deeper into some of these topics. The first step in any research project is study design. This lays the foundation for the entire investigation. In a conservation genomics context, some important design elements that should be decided on early are sampling strategy, how many samples and covering what sort of geographic distribution will be collected, uh, which genetic markers or regions of the genome are going to be targeted for sequencing, the laboratory methods, the sequencing methods, the analytical methods, and finally, how will results be communicated to conservation end, end users, stakeholders, other researchers, and the wider public? Decisions at this point will depend well, firstly on the research question and the aims, but also on the budget, the types of samples that are available um, or that are going to be able to be collected. And finally, the genomic resources that are already available for the study species, because some molecular techniques can't be applied without previously generated genetic data. After the study design has been agreed upon, the next step is to go get the samples. Usually this involves fieldwork uh, and some things that researchers will keep in mind uh, when planning field visits and sample collection. Uh, sampling strategy, obviously. Uh, safety considerations, particularly for remote work. Ethics approval, uh, especially if wildlife will need to be handled. Permits required for carried out, carrying out research on public land or agreements needed with, for example, private landowners or traditional owner groups. Finally, an important consideration for sample collection is how to store samples until they can be transferred to the lab. Sample storage requirements may vary depending on the sample type and the downstream methods and analyses that are gonna be applied to those samples. Uh, but generally as a good rule of thumb, it's uh, important to keep samples cold uh, with the cold, but avoiding freeze thaw cycles in the dark away from UV light and in a solution or buffer that limits enzyme and microbial activity. These things will prevent DNA degradation or minimize it at least. After samples have been collected, the next step in a conservation genomics project is to extract the genetic material from the collected samples. This process aims to produce a pure and concentrated form of DNA in an aqueous solution for further analyses. Broadly, the main steps involved here are to firstly digest the sample, that is use chemical or physical disruption to break down the cellular structures. And then secondly, to separate the DNA from the other cellular debris, lipids, proteins, other chemicals. There's a very wide variety of techniques for achieving these steps and the choice of method will be guided by the sample type and the DNA characteristics that are required for the next steps. Which brings me to, brings me to quality checking. After DNA extraction, DNA is going to be subjected to various quality checks to make sure that they meet the requirements of the chosen sequencing method. Hopefully if the study was designed carefully, everything will have been carried out up till this point to, to ensure that that's the case. But some sample types are inherently variable in their DNA quality. And sometimes things do go awry in the field or the lab. So these checks are important. Uh, typically, these are some characteristics that will be checked. The total yield or concentration. So this is the total amount of DNA in an extract. Some sequencing methods have very specific requirements. Uh, some need more than others. The fragment length distribution. So when DNA is in a cell, it's organized into chromosomes, which can be very long. For example, the human chromosome uh, varies from 50 million to 250 million base pairs. But during sample collection, storage and extraction, usually uh, chromosomes are fragmented to a certain extent. 
And since some sequencing methods and subsequent analyses require longer fragment length than others, it's common to check the distribution uh, available to you in the extract. Finally, the purity of DNA might be assessed. Some molecules and chemicals can be co-purified with DNA during extraction. And some of these can interfere with uh, downstream molecular methods and sequencing. Those sort of molecules are referred to as inhibitors, and it's really important that they are removed before going on to prepare DNA for sequencing. Okay, so the process of preparing DNA for sequencing is sometimes called library preparation. Uh, and the goal is to get DNA ready to run on the sequencing equipment. Again, it's a huge range of different methods available here. It's going to depend on which genetic markers or regions of the genome are being targeted and the sequencing method being used. But the unifying feature of all library prep methods is a step attaching adapters to the DNA fragments to be sequenced. So adapters are short sequences of synthesized DNA which will flank the DNA fragments to be sequenced. In this diagram, the two black lines are the DNA fragment that is going to be sequenced, and the green, yellow, and purple lines are the adapters. Sequencing equipment use the known sequences in the adapters to recognize and thereby read the DNA fragment, which is why after the DNA, uh, well, after the adapters are attached to the DNA fragments, we refer to the DNA as a DNA library. It's a library of DNA, which the sequences can read. Other steps that might be, might be part of the library prep process, uh, fragmentation and size selection. Some sequences have specific lengths that they can handle. Uh, a whole, there's a whole range of different ways of targeting different genomic regions. And finally, cleanups to remove non-target DNA and other reagents that might've been introduced during the library prep steps. Once DNA has been converted into a library, it's ready for sequencing uh, in which the genetic data is generated from those DNA molecules. So it's the process of determining the sequence of nucleotides or bases in a DNA molecule. Again, huge variety of options, different companies, different technologies that enable this process. I'm just gonna briefly describe the most common. This is a Sanger sequencer. It is the original sequencer. The human genome was first produced on these machines. Uh, but they're not used so much anymore. They can really only sequence one fragment at a time. And this low scalability means that the cost per base pair of that sequence is actually quite high. Contemporary sequences are referred to as high throughput sequences or sometimes next generation sequences. Uh, there's actually a variety of technologies that fall under this heading, but their binding feature is the ability to sequence many, many, many uh, molecules simultaneously. And in doing so, they drastically bring down the cost of sequencing. So this graph shows the cost of sequencing a mega base of DNA. It's a million base pairs. And the white line is Moore's law. So it's the expected decrease in cost as technology improves. As you can see, in the early 2000s, when high throughput sequences became commercialized, the cost of sequencing dropped dramatically. Keep in mind that this y-axis is log scaled. So a megabase of sequencing dropped from around $1,000 to less than 10 cents. This has led to a revolution in the use of genomic data across all sciences. These are the three most commonly used high, thru high throughput sequencing platforms available today, Illumina, PacBio, and Oxford Nanopore. Uh, these are companies that each produce a range of sequencing equipment, a bit like Apple produces a range of iPhones. Uh, the main differences between these companies is the technology that is used to produce the sequences, which in turn influences the read length that they can produce, the throughput, the scalability, uh, the error pro profiles, and also the instrument size and portability. Uh, researchers will choose the appropriate platform based on their specific sequencing needs. All right. So although this isn't technically part of the data creation steps, I wanted to touch briefly on what comes next in conservation genomics projects. Once data comes off the machine, there are data processing and analysis steps. This can involve converting data between different formats, uh, more quality checking and filtering, 
a host of statistical analyses, and finally graphical plotting to help with communication of results. All this to say that the project is far from over when the data comes off the sequencer. There's still a large number of steps that need to be carried out, and this can take a substantial amount of research at time. Finally, I want to mention service providers. Service providers are companies or organizations that can be contracted by researchers to perform some or all of the laboratory steps that I've mentioned. Some may also offer data processing or even basic anal analysis steps. Service providers can reduce the cost involved in creating genomic data as they can provide greater efficiency of scale than is possible by um, in a small lab group. Uh, for example, by purchasing reagents in bulk, pooling large numbers of, numbers of samples across projects, automating various steps and taking advantage of the highest throughput sequences, cost per sample can be minimized. This is why that um, while many research groups will have their own equipment or access to shared facilities, they still may choose to use a service provider. However, because these service providers tend to pool across projects, they typically won't accept non-standard sample types or run unique bespoke custom techniques. Uh, these are the four biggest service providers in Australia, but there are others. Um, each will have a slightly different menu of services they offer and requirements they set for the samples that they will take. Okay, that's all from me for module 5.2. Just to summarize, the main steps in a conservation genomics project are study design, sample collection and storage, DNA extraction and quality checks, preparing DNA for sequencing, actually sequencing, and data processing and analyses. I hope you found this module useful. For more details on many of these steps, other aspects of conservation genomics projects, and a number of end-to-end -end case studies, please check out the other modules in the open course. Thank you to all those parties who have contributed to and continue to contribute to TSI.